All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And again, welcome to our presentation uh, on resumes. We're going to talk about resume writing and some new elements that are surrounding this process today. So I'd like to start with just letting people know that if you're at work, if you're in any environment where you need to step away or take a break, you certainly can do that because we are recording this presentation and everyone will get a recording um, no later than tomorrow. Uh, we turn these into YouTube uh, clips and so we will send that out to you um, with a survey and some other uh, resources you can use. At the bottom of the page here, you'll see that if uh, you need to contact us anyway, you can certainly email us at careers at wgu.edu. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll share some other ways of making contact with us. So our agenda will consist of talking about the first thing that folks really need to know are um, areas that surround the applicant tracking systems. So when you apply to a job, it doesn't go to a person. Um, it does go to an electronic scan system where it picks up keywords, things like that. So we need to talk about that a little bit. We will do a resume walkthrough of a mock uh, resume. We'll talk about some common do's and don'ts. And then we'll talk a little bit about job descriptions and how important job descriptions are when you're doing a job search or applying to a position. And then we'll have a chance for questions and answers, a Q&A at the end of our presentation. So when we talk about those applicant tracking systems or the ATS, the first thing is that most employers today in just about every industry are using these methods to collect resumes, to sort of catalog applicants, if you will. Uh, you're create, they create a, a file on you as an applicant, so things are much more organized. But the other part of the applicant tracking systems, and probably the most important to the empo employer and the recruiter, is that they scan the resumes to see if you are a match to that specific job you're applying to. So that's why it's pretty important to make sure that you're customizing and tailoring your resume every single time. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule, of course, and we could talk about those. But for the most part, at every chance you get, tailoring your resume, using those keywords, using those uh, skills and qualifications that the employer is asking for is going to be to your best interest in making it through those ATS scans and getting it to the hiring manager. So there are two critical things to keep in mind. One is basically don't use a template that you find out there on Microsoft, especially if it's what we call overly formatted. Now I've seen a few that are okay, but most of the time they're gonna have columns, they'll have colored bars. I've even had a couple of students send me resumes with their picture on it, um, using icons like a little telephone, little email, little, you know, LinkedIn thing. Um, those do not go through the applicant tracking systems. And there's a higher chance that if those applicant tracking systems are maybe an older version that employers are using, it's a high possibility that they could just throw your resume out thinking it's spam. So to keep it simple, to keep it straightforward, just use a regular Word document. Now, when you do that, the other critical thing is that those applicant tracking systems will have a greater chance of scanning your resume for those keywords so that you have what they call a high 
match rate. That match rate is going to be based on the job descriptions. That's why it's important to consider those job descriptions when we're talking about this. Now here's another more detailed way of considering why those templates are not always the best to use and how the ATS will behave based on some templates that are out there. First of all, again, if they're highly stylized or overly formatted or embellished with colors and bars and pictures and um, word, uh, word boxes don't work or text boxes, headers and footers on resumes cannot be read all the time through ATS scans. So those are things you wanna leave off when we're talking about formatting and structuring your resume. A lot of folks will use a PDF and this is a little, it, it depends on the job description. So if they say to send in a, a Word resume, that's just send in a Word resume. If, do not, if they don't mention a PDF, then I would avoid sending in a PDF in case it doesn't go through their system. Uh, sometimes they'll tell you explicitly, we do not accept PDFs. Uh, sometimes they won't say anything at all. But in just about 100% of the time, I have known that the Word documents do go through the systems just fine. So you want to keep it with the Word document. If you use a Mac or if you're using Google Docs, something like that, make sure that you save it as a Word, uh, a Word document to the best of your ability. Avoid as I said earlier, columns, colored tables, um, other elements that may not be ATS friendly, so it gets through those systems. Now, here we are. <laughs> it's, it's going to mostly be a lot about AI. Um, how artificial intelligence is being used to write resumes how artificial intelligence is being used to um, scan and analyze those resumes. So a lot of people will ask, you know, like chat GPT, it, can I use that? Can I use that as, as a tool? Yes, you can use it as a tool, but then you wanna go back to that document and make it your own document. Make sure that it's in your voice, that it's a way that you would be identified as the author. Otherwise, when your resume may get through those, those applicant tracking scans, when you get to the interview, if they begin to ask any specifics of that resume and you're not familiar or comfortable with the language that the AI wrote, then employers are smart enough and becoming more and more cognizant that these tools like ChatGPT are being used and that could jeopardize your interview. So we don't want that to happen. So the benefits of using like a chat GPT or an AI uh, bot to write your resume, first thing is it can save time. And we all understand that. So if you're not a resume writer or you're not you know, comfortable or, or confident in your own writing ability, then Using a chat GPT or a resume writing um, AI uh, tool can at least help you to build the, the groundwork of a resume. Um, so that could be helpful, but again, you wanna go back and you wanna tailor your resume to fit the job. So you wanna make sure that you're using and, and editing, if you will, those keywords to the specific job description um, of the job that you're applying to. Now, we will be talking about some tools in just a moment about how you can use some online opportunities to do like a mock ATS scan. It'll scan your, your document, your resume. It'll look for possibly um, the tone it was written in, grammar, spelling check, uh, but it'll also have an opportunity for you to include the job description and then it will grade your resume as far as how it fits that particular job 
and oftentimes they'll give you a ma a month excuse me they'll give you a match rate score on that and that could be that could be pretty helpful and they can offer some tips and some things of that sort as well so there are some benefits of using an AI uh, tool like ChatGPT or some others to help you out. Now, these are some of the sample uh, ATS that are using AI as part of their scans. And you can either write these down now if you want to start using them but they will be included in the video that you will get a copy of this presentation uh, between now and tomorrow. Job scan, the very last bullet point, that's one that's very good. Um, that gives some really good uh, feedback and they have some other tools as well. Um, and that might be something to, to look at to use. Now, some of these I believe the last two, the job analytics and job scan is just .co. So it's not .com or .org or anything like that. So for an example, I'm putting in the chat, just jobscan.co would be the website. Um, you can Google these by name and get the exact link as well for that to use. Now, when your resume gets to a recruiter, when it gets to a human person, uh, typically the recruiters are going to spend 80% of their time looking at these sections of your resume. They're going to look at your name, obviously your contact information. They're going to look at and kind of skim through the document to see job titles, company details, bullet points, and they're looking for those keywords. You know, did were your previous jobs in some way relevant or transferable skills that can match what we're looking for? They'll look for start and end dates to see if there are any gaps in your history or if it looks like just based on your resume that you were job hopping from job to job to job, there is a way to, to counteract that, but that could be a red flag to some employers. And then of course, if a particular job requires a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, uh, then they will look at the education section. Here is a sample of a resume and I just wanted to walk through this just so folks who like to look at visual examples of what we've been talking about. Um, I may give you my own personal take on some of uh, the areas and sections here. So at the top, you want to have your name, obviously. I don't always advocate having your name in full all caps. Um, sometimes it can be a little difficult to read. So I would just use a mixed case, you know, just capitalize your first letter of your first name and last name. Um, this question comes up uh, at times, so I like to include it as well. If you go by a different name or you have a nickname that you most commonly go by, just wait. Instead of including it on your resume, wait until you get the interview and you introduce yourself, and then you can introduce yourself with your um, the common name you go by on a daily basis. Underneath your name, you obviously want to have your contact information. Um, I would still include, obviously, your phone number and email as your primary means of contact from the employer. Um, what's not up here is the city and state. And I've heard mixed responses to this that some recruiters still like to know kind of where you're coming from. Even if it's a remote job, they like to know kind of where applicants are located and where they're coming from. So it's not a bad idea to still include your city and state on your resume. And then of course, if you have a LinkedIn account, then you wanna put your LinkedIn URL on here. If you try to hyperlink it, just the word LinkedIn, and you try to hyperlink it to your URL page, make sure it's working. <laughs> Um, I've had students contact me. They've sent uh, their resumes in for review to our office 
and I've clicked on the LinkedIn URL and it goes to a broken page, broken link. So you want to make sure that everything is working correctly. That's um, first section there, your professional summary or your profile, however you want to term it. Um, that's like your 30 second commercial. So this is a section that you want to keep it brief, maybe no more than seven or eight lines. You want to make sure that you, again, you're writing to your audience and your audience is the job description. You have that job description in front of you. It tells you about what the job is, what the minimum qualifications are needed to be qualified for the position. So your summary should incorporate some of that information that you match so that you can get through those ATS scans and the recruiter will be able to understand that you are a qualified candidate for the position and then hopefully advance you to the next level. Now, this is where we get into a little bit of a gray, gray area, just in the sense that depending on your, your, career, your career trajectory, whatever your career path is, if it's in technology or even in healthcare, for example, you can have a separate section that that contains those specific skills that you would be um, bringing to the job. So if you're in IT, you're getting your IT degree from WGU, you can have a section called um, a technology, I get my computer work, uh, competencies. You know, so um, this is where you'll have you know, be able to put in your operating systems, databases, programming languages. Um, if you're in cybersecurity and you have a, a, a secret clearance or you're eligible for a clearance from previous jobs or military experience. So you can have a separate section that really contains and capsulizes your skill sets, um, specifically if they mention that on the job description. Then you can go right into your professional experience. So you can use a header or a little area that might give a couple of lines of your role at that particular job. And then you can go into your bullet points that reinforce your position. Most of the time I see folks who send in resumes and they just have bullet points. That's perfectly fine. But again, you want to make sure your bullet points are the priority of the order is most relevant or contains transferable skills to the job you're applying to. Probably no more than five to seven bullet points, five to seven two line bullet points. You don't want to keep it long. You don't want to keep it too wordy for that. All right. And then, um, and Sybil, I'm going to answer that question, uh, I think, in the next slide. So you'll see that, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, thank you for putting that in the chat. Um, the second entry there is just another way of some tips on content. How do, how do I write my, my bullet points, those accomplishment statements, as we call them? So you want to start with an action verb. Maybe, you know, that what your task was, what that role was. And then if you have any results, results can be quantified. So if you see the one example above it, where it talks about, you know, analyze statistical data to increase product by 20% and reduce compliant issues by 35%. But if you were in a job that did not have quantifiable results like this, maybe you would use something to the effect of, you know, um, demonstrable customer service skills to solve problems resulting in return business. Something to that effect. My pointer doesn't want to work. All right. So then your last section could be your education section. Um, just a few words about this. 
if you're getting your master's degree, obviously that's going to be listed first. Even with WGE, with Western Governors University, you still want to include the city and state. So just put Salt Lake City, Utah. That's our that's our headquarters, and so that's that's fine to put there. Oh, let me go let me go back up for one quick second because I want to bring this to your attention. When you're doing your professional experience, make sure that your start and end dates are to the far right margin. The reason for that is that you want to make it easy for the employer to just skim down the right edge of the page or, you know, the resume, and they can easily see your dates and see that there are no gaps and what, you know, how long you've been at a particular job. It's just a way to make it easier for the employer and that that's you want to make keep them happy. <laughs> so. All right. So again, with the education section, when you put your, if you're getting your master's degree, then you list that first and then your bachelor's degree. Um, and it, in these cases, it doesn't really matter if it's relevant to the industry or not. It's just the protocol of a resume writing style. If you have a master's, then you always include a bachelor's, but that's where you stop with having to include both of those um, degree programs. If you're getting your bachelor's degree, you just stop at the bachelor's degree. You don't need to put an associate's degree, even if it is eligible or um, relevant to the, to the job or the industry. Um, because mostly employers will require a bachelor's degree in any particular program but they won't consider the associates because their company will not be considering an associate's degree as a qualifiable element. So go ahead and just put the bachelor's. That's what they're asking for. That's what you want to give them for that. Now I'm going to stop here for a moment and address uh, some questions. Uh, the qu first question is about how far back in the work history um, and you're right. When, when we're talking about different industries, it gets a little, um, there's some flexibility. So typically you would want to go back no more than 10 to 15 years. Most employers are going to be, uh, really skills oriented. They're going to be looking at what's, what, what skill sets and experience do you have? That's first most relevant today, especially because technologies are changing, even in healthcare, some healthcare clinical um, work has changed between now and 20 years ago. Um, some are the same, of course, but you want to give them the most recent experience that you have. So if you see, as Sybil had asked, if you're seeing something specific in a word, in a job description that says they want, it's, they want all of your work history and they want to go back X number of years, then you do that up to, up to high school. So, for example, uh, like Sybil said, that some nursing uh, jobs, they want to go all the way back 20 years, but you only have 11 years because you were in high school before that. Well, then you stop at high school. I throw that in there just, just to kind of fill out the <laughs> my thoughts with that. Okay. So, again, typically it's going to be, and, and now the reason for that is, everyone, is that if you go back, you know, at generally speaking, so I'm speaking in, in general terms at this point, if you go back more than 10 to 15 years, then your resume gets too long, it gets too complicated, and employers are just going to stop, you know, at, you know, it's like 10 years. And I've, I've had recruiters tell me that. They'll, they'll look at the history, they'll stop at 10 years, and they're not going to read anything else. Um, so you want to keep that in mind. And again, Nicole had a um, a comment that sometimes that 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 years of experience um, can also be attached to uh, your pay grade. So if somebody comes in and says, "Well, this is a quote unquote entry level job, but I've got 15 years in the industry, so I'm an, I'm going to expect 15 years of 
of pay for that. Well, that's probably not going to happen, <laughs> right? That's just, if it's entry level, they're still going to ask for a number of years experience and this gets controversial. So the reason they'll say it's entry level, but we need two to three years or four years experience. Entry level doesn't mean zero experience. They're going to, they're going to train you on the job. They expect that you'll bring some experience with you. Now that could be academic experience. So your degree, if you have a bachelor's, you know, you'll say your bachelor's science could equal one to two years of experience or a master's of science or a master of arts could be maybe two to three years. Um, I don't have a scientific formula for that, but based on my almost 20 years of being a career coach and working with career development, a lot of employers and HR personnel have said that they will factor in your education, projects, things you've done on the side, volunteer work, um, all of that can um, only be used to give you the best, the best look possible. So, um, Kit had a problem, uh, not a problem, I'm sorry, your uh, question. Um, no, if you're getting your, if you're getting your bachelor's degree in healthcare or nursing, then you want to go by your bachelor's degree. If you look at many of the job descriptions, they're going to say that they would require at least a bachelor's degree. So your associates would not factor into that, um, that element of seeing if you're qualified for the position. Uh, let's see. There's another question. Is there a resource explaining how to format the date on the right with the same line having tech text on the right? You just, it's, you know, you, if I understand you correctly, um, you can, you know, you put your cursor on the text to the left. If you want, have a couple of spaces, write out the dates. And I would typically, I mean, you can do June, you know, use the month 2024 if you want, or just, you know, the number seven. I don't like to use just the numbers because it looks a little busy, just like numbers. It's easier to see the date if you fill it in, um, write it out. You don't need the, the day, so you don't need the specific day, just the month and year. But when you put that on that same line as the text, just use your space bar and space it over to where your margin stops. Make sure it doesn't go to the next line. If it does, then backspace it over back. I am hoping that answers your question and that's the right thing you're asking. Okay. All right, good. Well, let's uh, move on to a few more things here. Here's another format that's not often seen, but sometimes I will get questions about this. If you're a career changer and you're getting your degree because you're you're pivoting into a whole new uh, field, and if you wrote your resume based on your previous work, it wouldn't make sense to your new direction, then here's a format that might be useful. And we call it a skills-based resume or a functional resume. So the top, will be basically the same. You'll have your contact information. You'll have a professional summary that states your new direction. And then you might start with your education section at the top. So you're highlighting your education over your work experience because you're, you're pivoting to a new direction. Then instead of doing a chronological bullet pointed history of your work, you would do maybe major skills that you have, you've picked up from all of your jobs, you've picked up from life, you've picked up from your household, whatever the case may be. But if they're relevant to the next step in your career, you can put them into these sections like major skill number one, number two, number three. Well, of course, you're gonna name that, right? So that's all we put, you know, example management. Um, if this is an HR person, for example, or they want to go into to training, uh, employee training, so management, resiliency, 
you know, inspire. Um, and then we have some questions there to kind of fill that out. Um, some IT majors will do this and they'll put maybe projects that they've worked on. And if their projects utilized the types of tools that the job description is saying you need to be skilled in this, they're using a skills-based resume to highlight their projects on how they've used those tools in an effort to show how they're qualified for that next job. Then at the bottom of the resume would be your work history. No bullet points, just a job title, company, city and state, and the year to year of employment. If you have a gap in your work history, then you wanna, you wanna put a placeholder. So some folks will say, well, I've been in school for the last couple of years, you know, getting my degree. Well, then you would put that pursuing degree in, fill in the blank, Western Governors University, Salt Lake City, Utah, and then your expected graduation date. It does, and obviously looks like it's, it's duplicating your education section, but in this point of your resume, it's acting as a placeholder. Stay-at-home parent, you know, last name, you know, family. Uh, I'd say, you know, stay-at-home parent, Garen family, Dallas, Texas, year to year. You know, stuff like that. Then whatever the next, you know, um, paid for, you know, position where you were getting a W-2 at the end of the year, uh, that sort of thing. You can follow it. So I just wanted to share this with you in case it might be intriguing or maybe um, help folks who are maybe in this situation. Now, some quick uh, do's and don'ts. So things you want to always keep in mind on your resume is that uh, your resume does not have a title. Sometimes people will put the job, maybe, you know, um, cybersecurity specialist at the top of their resume if that's the job you're applying to, that's fine, but it's optional. You don't really have to do that. Um, you also do not want to put any seeking, what I call seeking terminology. So seeking a new job in accounting. Sometimes folks will put that. I've seen it. You don't want to put that on there. Um, they will expect that you are not, they know you're looking for a job. That's why you're applying to, to the job. Um, so you don't have to include it. But that summary qualifications is also, again, your 30-second commercial that should be talking about your skill sets and what you've already collected, not what you're looking for. That makes sense. Okay. And yes, uh, Sybil, the, the um, skills-based resume does work with the ATS. It's not embellished with anything else. It's not looking for, it's not going to be looking for format development. It'll be looking for more um, content that's there. But you don't want the format like pictures and uh, bars and, and things to get in the way. So, yep. All right. So when it comes to the type of font to use, I usually like to use um, a sans serif font. And that's, that's all the other fonts that are not going to be like Times New Roman. They're not going to be, you know, kind of fancy looking, quote unquote. Um, Times New Roman is still fine to use. And I see them mostly on real um, like C-suite type of executive resumes. They look fine. A sans serif font like Calibri or Arial or Verdana, uh, the kind of fonts that you're we're seeing here in the chat, for example, clean, classic, easy to, easy to read, um, are usually good to go with. Now, this next bullet point, again, is a little controversial at times. So um, one page would be great, would be optimal, but it may not be realistic. So if you have a strong number of experience, like in the nursing field uh, that you're coming from and you're advancing your career, um, one page is probably not going to cut it. So a two-page resume would be perfectly acceptable. If I... If I was coming from, say, working in a restaurant and I had a lot of waiter and bartending experience in my history, 
and putting that on a resume made it go into a second page, then I need to cut it back because that's, that's not what I'm getting my degree in from WGU. So you want to reference those work experiences and the transferable skills. But if it is the majority of the body of your resume, then that could be a, uh, a red flag to an employer. You want to maintain, maintain consistency in the formatting. That mostly means like the bullet points. Make sure things are lined up nice and straight. They're not jagged or staggered around the page. And again, as I said before, you want to be intentional on the content and make sure it's tailored to the job descriptions that you find and that you're applying to, to into those jobs. Now, there are times to say, let's say you're going to a job fair or you're posting your resume on LinkedIn. Um, what do you do then? You know, because you've got that there. Now, it's possible and I haven't I haven't checked recently, but if you can if you can include more than one resume on LinkedIn or on Handshake using Handshake, um, then you can have maybe a couple of different resumes depending on um, the kind of jobs that you're applying to. But if you're going to like a job fair where you only can have one resume, obviously, then you want to do the best you can to tailor it to the industry, if not the specific job. So if it's not going to be toward a front end, you know, front end designer in the IT field, then maybe you would tailor it toward simply, you know, software development, you know, using your, your general software development and engineering skills rather than front end specific, uh, skill sets. All right. Things to avoid. And some of these we've talked about, um, and, but I like to point them out as well. Um, making sure that if you're using a chat GPT, I didn't put it in a bullet point, but if you're using a chat GPT, make sure that you are going back and you're customizing it, you're reading it, proofread it, uh, to make sure it's in your own voice, that it is a document that is honest to you. Um, you're only using that chat GPT or AI tools to get inspiration, to get the ball rolling, get started, uh, but not to be the sole author of your document. In the same way, you don't want to copy and paste just the job description into your resume. That's I've seen that a couple of times and it's obvious the way it's written that it was just a cut and paste kind of job. Um, I don't see this very often, but I do like to point it out in case it, the idea is still floating out there somewhere. Because a lot of the ATS scans and the uh, consideration of a candidate will be using those keywords, of the job descriptions, I have had a couple times, actually not here at WGU, but another university I worked at, where a student took, you know, wrote out all the keywords that were relevant to the industry and then kind of colored them white at the bottom of his resume or even the top of his resume so that they were picked up by the ATS, you know, scans. Well, the problem with that is it's cheating, <laughs> basically. Um, and if he didn't have any of those or she had any of those skill sets, they're just trying to get through the applicant tracking system. Um, it's, it's kind of a uh, fraud as well. Now, these are comments that come from employers and when they find them and if he goes through an applicant tracking system and those applicant tracking systems, maybe turn the entire resume to black type those words are obviously going to be visible. And when it gets to a hiring manager or an HR personnel and they see that, they obviously will reject that application. Best practice, just keep it simple. Keep it honest. You know, that's the best, best policy. You no longer have to list uh, references upon request. That was a thing back in the day. Uh, but that day has passed. So when employers want references, they will ask you for that uh, close to, you know, finalizing your candidacy for, for a position. 
but they will ask you for a separate document um, when they need references. Again, uh, avoid using tables on your resume, text boxes, borders, photos, pictures, icons, colors, graphics, things like that. It, um, it just kind of muddies the water. They may not make it through those applicant tracking systems. Um, and if they miss information, but it's there, but they can't see it because they're hidden behind those, those stylistic elements, then um, you may not be considered for the candidacy. On your summary of qualifications, you want at the very top, you want to uh, avoid using personal pronouns. I, me, my, our. Again, that's a writing style that is uh, specific to resume writing. Um, it's just kind of the writing uh, protocols of that. So uh, pertaining or staying honest to those writing styles is uh, the best policy, I think. And then again, if you're concerned about space and you're trying to optimize without being too, um, looking too bad on the page, the smallest font you can go to is 10 point. Uh, your margins can be a half inch. So you can go up to, like if you're using Word, you can go up to the top left, um, click on uh, the formatting and then the margins you can use narrow and that will, that will be, you know, just fine to, to use it that way. All right. So one quick question, uh, Constance asks about a, a gap in her resume. Um, no, if it's four months, then you don't need to uh, address that that way. You might, um, if you were in school, and we addressed this a moment ago, um, if you were in school during that time, then you can put your school there as a placeholder and that could be fine. Um, usually gaps due to the pandemic, it was understandable that there could be, there could be gaps. And so, um, you might, you know, put, um, uh, maybe what you were doing, if you were enhancing or working with. Um, skills or anything else um, for your job search. If you were doing classes on the side, if you're taking building projects, things like that. So that could be something you could put there if that makes sense. All right. So good. Here's a sample of a job description. And I wanted to just pull this out to, to kind of, um, emphasize what I was talking about earlier. When you're reading a job description, the words in red are words that are going to be major skills that are used in that particular job. The ones that are in bold are the ones that, you know, come up more often. And that's what you want to make sure is on your resume. Does that make sense? I hope so. But, um, so customer service, look how many times that comes up. Communication, collaboration. Um, the top of the resume or the top of the job description discusses the culture of the company, what they do, a heavy emphasis on clear communication, collaboration uh, within their team. So they're talking about who they are and what they do. Then the bullet points begin to identify this is what you'll be doing at this job. And then it gets into to be qualified, this is what would be required. A bachelor's degree, master's preferred, but they'll consider a bachelor's. Three years of experience, expert knowledge in these areas, strong problem solving skills. So these are areas that you want to pay attention to to make sure that um, they're on your resume. All right, so a couple of things here, let's see. All right, one for, uh, as a travel nurse, at the end of every contract, usually 13 weeks, uh, they always want the references from the last job, so I add them. Should I not do that? If they do ask for those references in the job description, and that's kind of how I would probably judge, do I include these or not? 
if it doesn't specifically ask for references of the last job in the job description, um, then I would not put it on the resume. In your experience, if you have consistently been asked for those references after each of the different contracts, then obviously you're keeping a log of those of sorts or a document of that. If you can submit that separately, then you might, you might consider doing that. Um, if it's still a question and there's no real answer or direction, then I would probably wait until um, maybe you hear back from the next employer. And then you have those available and ready to send at that moment. So as much as possible, as far as using these keywords, do you need to use the exact words? Um, I would say, I would say if the job description is saying these are the skills that are required and using this as an example, customer service, automotive, you know, communication and collaboration skills, I would use those the way they're written because they're telling you what that is. It's a difference between saying, you know, possess strong customer service skills, but you say, I'm good with people. Well, that could be customer service skills, but good with people may not be interpreted by the ATS. I hope that that helps. All right. And the same with um, like putting Microsoft Excel. If they ask for Microsoft Excel, put Microsoft Excel. Uh, just putting spreadsheets may not be interpreted by the ATS. So I, I try to stick as close to exactly what they're asking for as possible. There are some gray areas. So I'm not going to, I definitely will acknowledge there are areas. Um, and, and the reason why resumes are important, obviously, and there, people really want to have a handle on resumes is that this is the first impression right? This is the first impression to an employer and you want to get it as right as possible. And there are some holes. There are some areas that we just don't have some answers to from the employer's perspective. So all of us who would be in looking for a job, keeping up with their resumes, have to do the best we can with the resources that we have. Yes. Um, there is, the question is, are there uh, any best ways to translate military acronyms, job titles, positions into civilian terms? Yes, we, hold on. <laughs> uh, we have a military and veteran page. And we have some skills translators. And I'm going to put that in the resume here. I hope it works. Let's see if it does. Might be a long URL, not too long. All right. So hopefully that will help you out. But definitely, and that's a great question. I'm glad that, that you brought that up. Um, in any industry you're coming from, if it's IT, if it's... Uh, you know, you're a military veteran or you're transitioning back to civilian life, um, keep the specific details of your job to more of civilian wording. Uh, don't use acronyms. Um, don't use your MOS. You know, that's your military occupational specialty. Um, it's usually a number, you know, Bravo 278 or something like that. Um, so keep your, you know, translate it into the job titles or the positions those uh, those translators, I think you'll find helpful to, to help you out with that. Yes, there is a separate session on cover letters. Um, I do that as well. And we talk about the details of cover letters. So that would be scheduled. If you look at this page on your screen here, um, I'm gonna talk to you and, and, cover, and show you how to get to our resume resource page. But at the top where you see the green arrow, if you go across actually to career events, when you go to our homepage, that's where you'll see the scheduled 
um, career events that we have. We are right into April. And so this is our, um, we have a career focus of different events and employer events. And so um, you'll probably be getting those in your email if you haven't already. And so that's something you want to look into to, to see that. Okay, so let's, uh, with a, we need to keep a track on time. So let me go through this real quick here and we'll, we'll go over some other questions in just a moment. So when you go to our, our homepage, pardon me, uh, let me uh, get that here for you. Just gonna let me do it. I'm gonna put this in the chat. So you can walk through that as well if you want. But when you go to the homepage, you go up to Career Tools, click on that. Then the next page under Resource Library, you'll see Get the Job. And you'll click on that heading. That will take you to the Resource Library. Then again, over to the left, you can click on Resumes. When you click on Resumes, you'll also see cover letters there. But when you click on resumes, you'll see the resume page. This is what you will need to go through when you would like a review of your resume. So instead of just sending it to us, we want you to go through these steps because they're going to help you with all of the areas of writing or editing or reviewing your resume before you turn them into us for that professional review. Step two is where you can find some other sample templates. You can find some other sample resources, supplemental resources, action verbs, how to write an accomplishment statement, how do I write my summary qualifications. All of that can be found in step two. And then follow those steps. That's going to be good for you to um, be able to um, get a good start on your resume. Now we can do a q and <laughs> I know you've been asking questions during, during the presentation and that's perfectly fine. When those pop up during a certain, a certain section we're talking about, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So that, that works out just well, very well. Um, now, um, Sharon has said that she cannot see anything and I'm not sure if you can, if you can let me know a little bit more about what you mean, but, um, any other questions pertaining to what we've talked about? Um, all right. And I want to also show you this last page and I put that, put this in the chat. So if you want to go and explore those resources, that's the first step I would recommend. Look at those resume resources we have. We have our res this course that we're talking about. We have other events as well. Um, and then once you go through that resume, those resume resources in that course, then you can be able to um, email that information to us, that sort of thing. Ways to contact you if you have any quick questions, like oh, I got a quick question that's like two seconds, then you can call us, you know, and you'll get a call back that same day. Um, and then other ways that we're present online. Uh, we do have a Facebook, we're on LinkedIn as well, things of that sort. Yes, so Aaron, there is a way of addressing the the different gaps. Sometimes it would, it would need to be um, grouped together, if you will. Um, I'll give you a quick, a quick example. Um, so if, and then you can use your own wording, your own, you know, one way to do this. But it may be um, starting with, let's say, various, various customer service roles, if you want to say it that way. And then let's say the dates, let's say the date might be, you know, 2019 to... 2024. Okay. So you might start with just a general 
what what can capture those different those different kind of roles or jobs that you had and then um, that could be um, you know the next word could be Dallas Texas you know I'm in Dallas so that's what I have to um, and then maybe the maybe bullet points uh, would be more of um, transferable skills I'd say no more than five to seven. So if I were going into say a human resources role, because I'm getting my, my master's or I'm getting my bachelor's in HR management and, but I, I don't have that experience, but I have a lot of customer service jobs I had in the past. Then I would highlight, you know, um, ability to interact with a variety of clients. My next bullet point could be um, uh, demonstrated ability to train and mentor other um, or train and mentor new new personnel, something like that. Um, professional communication skills to interact with both ta uh, teams and leadership. You know, it could be something like, I'm just pulling these out of the air. So that's something you have to kind of play around with. If it's, again, looking at the resources, some of the things we talked about, putting a sample resume together, bringing these things together um, through the resume resources and the course uh, link that I sent to you, and then submitting your resume for review might be a good way to do that. If you're not ready for it yet, um, but you still needed to talk through some details, that's when you can make an appointment with us to go into real more granular examples that an advisor can help you with. Okay. Sharon, I'm sorry you're having some, some problems with the screen. Um, if you came in later, we are recording this session, so you'll be able to get at least the recording of it and uh, hopefully that would be helpful. All right. All right, folks, we are just about at our stopping point. So I am going to stop the recording here. All right. And uh, I hope you got something out of this that was helpful. Um, again, uh, you will be hearing from me at least by the end of the day tomorrow. I should have a copy of today's presentation and I will send it out to you all. So thank you again for joining and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.